All right, so today we're gonna to be going over some uh, basics of pair Scylla and pair IPM in general, and then some of our, our new research and things we've been working on for the past couple of years. So our main topic of concern in, in pair pest management is pair Scylla, and that's really gonna be the main focus of today. So just to go over some basic stuff about pair Scylla, it's a pair specialist. It'll basically feed and attack um, all different pair varieties. It seems to really prefer the European pear varieties, which are what we're growing here in, in Washington and Oregon primarily. Um, so Anjos, Bartlett's, uh, Camis, all those are, are highly preferred. Uh, it'll actually go after Bradford pears, which are the ornamental pears you see around town as well, but it rarely complete, completes development and they don't seem to be injured too much by it. But it's just kind of interesting if you are walking around town and you see a Bradford pear flowering in the spring, you can go up to it and you might find some Scylla on it. Um, so pear Scylla have piercing sucking mouth parts. Uh, it's kind of like the way a mosquito works. You think about they have that stylet that they stick into you. Well, pear Scylla has pretty much the same thing. However, it just uses that to suck on plant phloem, um, pear phloem to be specific. Um, so when it's um, sucking the juices out of the pear, basically it's getting a ton of water and sugar. And what it really wants are the amino acids. Um, so it has to just keep sucking and sucking and sucking and excreting all this sugar water honeydew because uh, it's just too much waste. Um, and that's what gets all over your trees and causes them to become sticky and then gets on the fruit and causes that injury that we don't like to see. So here are the life stages of pear Scylla. We obviously start with our adults in the early spring um, as they come out, actually even before that in the late, late winter, um, they'll turn into eggs, then into young nymphs on the far right, and then the old nymphs, which are these, these large, dark, uh, uh, interesting looking insects, uh, and then back to adults. And there are three complete generations a year uh, in the top right, you can see this phenology of Paracilla. Uh, this is the adult generations. And you're probably thinking to yourself, well, I see four humps and you just told me there are three generations. Well, that fourth hump there in September, uh, that's the overwintering adult generation. And the that will um, hang around all winter and go into trees and things like that and, and become the uh, April or the uh, early spring generation. So those first and last generations there are essentially the same. All right, so speaking of the overwintering generation, let's talk a little bit about um, how these guys overwinter because it's, it's kind of interesting and it's also important to management. So in the fall, which is the season we went through not too long ago, as you may remember, um, the Paracilla adults uh, will exhibit this interesting behavior where they partially migrate. So partially, I mean, some of them will leave the orchard and they'll go into just about any other living um, plant source and they'll move around a lot. But anything that's alive, any plant that's alive, they can kind of hang out on and feed uh, just to get water and survive. And then a bunch of them will also just stay in the orchard, which is um, kind of unique. And uh, how many leave the orchard versus how many stay uh, will vary from year to year, kind of depending on, on weather. Uh, really sunny, nice falls, Scylla will move around a lot more and leave the orchard. Um, however, if the fall is kind of crummy and, and wet, they just hunker down and they don't, they don't leave the orchard as often. So in late winter, early spring, um, Scylla basically will start to recolonize these, uh, our, our pear orchards, at least the ones that left. Um, and the ones that were already in the orchards, well, they'll they'll also do some moving too, and they basically will go from orchard to orchard. This just basically just becomes a, a it's a period of high dispersal activity. So the scylla are constantly moving, and um, this this movement and mating and, and cycling from orchard to orchard and back in from um, external sources will go on for quite a long time period. So really, February to April, we're seeing all this movement take place. Um, which is, is quite important for management because you may 
get the, the urge to put on a early season spray that's going to kill all your Scylla. However, um, it's, it's not that easy because they continue to move into the orchard and move from one orchard to another. So this is why we often end up seeing the use of surround because it's a long lasting repellent at this time period as opposed to trying to get a knockdown spray. So as far as what, what Scylla are targeting um, as adults when they are looking for places to lay their eggs or oviposit, um, at dormant, when before the buds really uh, open up, uh, Scylla kind of go after the woody areas of the plant, uh, of the bud. Um, they'll focus in uh, around those crevices that are just below the, the developing bud to lay their eggs. And you can see the picture in the center there, uh, these little teeny yellow eggs that are just sitting in the crevices there. And really, we, we kind of feel like these eggs aren't as important um, because they have to hang around much longer than the nymphs have to crawl up. And really, the, the, just the sheer number of eggs that you get around those crevices uh, well, is, is nothing compared to what we start to see at this bud burst stage. So the, the silver will, will go after this woody areas until the bud really opens up and shows that fresh, soft green tissue. And at that point, the adults will target that material and, and they really start to put down a lot of eggs. And, and this is a particularly vulnerable time um, so it, it, it becomes a critical management time point where if you are going to use an adult aside uh, right before the bud burst time frame, that's the time when you'd like to get a good knockdown on, the, on these Scylla adults. But be, all before that, if you have a good surround down um, to protect that woody tissue, um, not much is changing as far as where they're targeting. So that's a, a, a great approach to start out with. So as the buds develop further and get into pink and popcorn and bloom, um, Scylla will, will continue to go after this new fresh material. They really focus on the flower stems. And then once the leaves develop, they'll start to go after the leaves. Um, and, and they'll kind of uh, continue to, to focus in on the, um, the buds. But really around, around bloom, you stop seeing as much over position. It kind of tapers off. Um, and really that's when we start to just see the development into nymphs and the, that first generation of adults dies off. Um, however, once the second generation of adults comes out, that's normally around when we start to see the vegetative shoots on the pears growing. Um, so the picture on the right there, um, that's gonna be the next target for Scylla. And you can see that, you know, all the, they obviously laid a bunch of eggs on the shoot and um, developed into nymphs and now we're seeing the honeydew from that. So parasilla injury, uh, again, it's, it comes from this excrement, which is just sugar water or honeydew. Uh, it gets all over the fruit and it causes a lot of different forms of in injury. Really, it can uh, cause this leaf necrosis just from suffocating the plant, um, uh, preventing uh, uh, photosynthesis and, and basically plant respiration. Uh, it also, um, marks the fruit, obviously, which is um, uh, what, what the economic damage is um, because it's hard to sell fruit that has a bunch of uh, black sooty mold all over it. Um, then also it, it creates these sticky, unpleasant working conditions uh, that it, it can be difficult to encourage somebody to or uh, get someone to work in your orchard if, if your pear trees are really sticky and they have a cleaner option somewhere else. So just general management for Paracilla, uh, what's being practiced currently, uh, that early season suppression is really critical because they come out in such high numbers and the trees are really vulnerable at this point because natural enemies aren't really available yet. Um, so particle films are pretty common, uh, uh, especially surround, uh, just because it kind of puts this protective layer over the tree and repels Scylla. Um, but we're also using a lot of sprays and this kind of varies from reason, region to region. Um, in some places they can get away with as little as two sprays a year. Um, other places like Wenatchee we're spraying up to 15 times and these programs can be incredibly expensive because insecticides are expensive. And we're seeing that people are spending up to if not more than $1,500 an acre just for their Scylla insecticides. Um, there are some cultural strategies that 
um, are used as well. So honeydew removal, since the main issue with Scylla is the honeydew they produce, um, uh, you can remove honeydew just by washing the trees, either using overhead watering systems uh, or air blast sprayers with um, high, high volumes of water. Um, there's summer pruning, so removing those suckers in the, in, in the summer. Um, as we show that, showed that picture earlier of the Scylla targeting those suckers, you can pull those off and that's um, you're, you're removing Scylla and you're removing the place where they want to lay their eggs. And then just general uh, controlling the amount of nitrogen you put into the trees. Scylla love very vigorous trees that have lots of nitrogen. Again, they're going after those amino acids. That's what, that's what um, helps them survive and, and gives them good nutrition. So the more nitrogen you give the plant, the more food you're giving the Scylla, and also you're giving them more leaf matter to go after as well. And of course, if you've been to one of my talks before, uh, you know that I'm going to start talking about natural enemies. So biological control with natural enemies, um, we've known this for over or nearly 100 years now that Scylla is controlled very well by natural enemies if you just let them develop. So let's talk about that in a little bit more detail. Why, why are these natural enemies, these things that attack Paracilla and feed on Paracilla, our predators, our lions of the, of the plant world, um, why are they so important uh, for controlling Paracilla? Well, one thing that is particularly obvious is that if you have a very large tree and your main uh, method of controlling an insect is, is by getting complete coverage with an insecticide, that's just simply hard to do. And when a lot of our trees are these really old trees that are have dense canopies, it's just hard to completely cover those trees with insecticides. So as the season goes on, this method becomes less effective. Um, there's also insecticide resistance. So Paracilla, uh, like many insects, eventually becomes tolerant to these insecticides when it's exposed to them so many times over and over again. Um, so the insecticides aren't working quite as well, or at least most of them, the older ones especially. Um, so later in the season, we simply have fewer insecticide options as we get closer to harvest uh, due to um, uh, residue um, limitations. And then of course, you know, natural enemies are free. I talked earlier about how much these spray programs cost. Um, they Natural enemies don't cost you any money. And especially if you're, um, trying to conserve them by spraying less, um, it's just a money saver all around. So I want to show some data here um, to back up my claims about insecticides, or I'm sorry, uh, natural enemies being important here and, and how insecticides affect those natural enemies. So these data are actually collected by Tiana and Chris and their team. Um, and they've been uh, scouting commercial orchards over the past four years now, uh, separating their, their orchard blocks into conventional IPM and organic. And here we have the natural enemies that they scouted out of uh, conventional orchards in 2019 in the Wenatchee River Valley. And what you can see here is that the conventional orchards really just don't have uh, natural enemy populations that are even comparable to uh, the IPM and organic orchards. So those numbers there on the graph are natural enemies and are three different orchard systems. Now I'm gonna show you what the uh, Scylla look like in those orchard systems. So as you can see, for the first part of the season, things look pretty similar. Um, it's kind of before we really expect natural enemies to take off and start uh, doing their thing. But man, at the end of the season, you can really see where the conventional orchards that don't have natural enemies um, that leads to this big spike in Scylla. And that's, again, at the end of the year, um, it's very difficult to uh, control Scylla with insecticides. So you really need those natural enemies at that point. So, oh, and now, now we have a poll question. So take a moment to answer that poll question there. Um, so uh, the, the challenge with Paracilla, this is the, the IPM challenge. It's, it's just, it's never easy, unfortunately. Um, so early in the season, like I said, the natural enemies really aren't, they haven't taken off just yet. 
and we have to do something to control those that early season Scylla population. However, we need to strike a balance. Okay, there we go. We kind of got to strike a balance between using our insecticides and um, and but not not overusing them because the more insecticides we use, or at least the more potent uh, these insecticides are that we're using. Uh, that's going to lead to us killing off these natural enemies, which we, we've seen. Uh, Tiana has really done a good job of showing that they are critical to that late season control. Sorry, I'm trying to advance the slide here and it's not letting me do it. Chris, turn off that poll and see if that helps Louis, please. Yeah, polls off on my screen. Oh, there we go. All right. <laughs> so like I was saying, no, if you don't have natural enemies, uh, that's gonna, it's pretty much a direct connection to having these late season Paracilla outbreaks. And then when we get Paracilla outbreaks that occur later in the season, obviously that leads to sticky fruit and sticky trees, um, which has that immediate economic effect if we have more culls. Um, but also this can lead to less productive trees. If we're constantly having trees that are really covered in honeydew and getting all this leaf necrosis because of the honeydew, uh, that just leads to, to trees that are, are less productive overall. Um, you have issues getting people to work in your orchard. And then most importantly, which I don't think is talked about enough, is that if we have large late season outbreaks of Paracilla and then we stop controlling for them after harvest, because who cares what happens after harvest, right? Well, that leads to just a huge population of Paracilla that we're going to have to then deal with next year. And when you go into the orchard in the spring, you see all these Scylla flying around. You're wondering, why is this happening to me? Well, it's because it's not just you, but it's because we're we're not controlling Scylla late in the late in, into the summer and into the fall. But again, the best way to do that late season control is to have natural enemies. So the goal really is to is to try to promote some strategies that that will allow you to control Scylla, especially early, but will end up having low harm to your natural enemies so they can develop and then take over in the late season. So some things that I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, are particle films and, um, and honeydew washing, but there are quite a few other techniques as well for Scylla. So we have particle films, uh, the use of insect growth regulators, which are softer conventional insecticides and, 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 and organic insecticides. Um, uh, so the honeydew washing again, uh, the summer pruning or suckering and, and then uh, reducing the nitrogen inputs. Um, and then the other thing that's really important to consider is that we're out there managing codling moth as well. And a lot of times we kind of think, well, maybe I can just kill two birds with one stone. I'll use something potent uh, that'll get my Scylla and my codling moth. And then I don't have to, you know, use mating disruption because, you know, whatever, I'm going to use some hardcore stuff for, for codling moth and Scylla. Why bother, right? Well, I would encourage you to take a step back and think to yourself, what is this going to do to my natural enemy population? So, codling moth is relatively easy to control in pairs. Uh, that that is um, a serious benefit to us here. So you can, if you use mating disruption, if you start with that, you can get away with a very soft spray program for codling moth and a and, and a spray program that won't harm your natural enemies. So. Um, relying on things like oil and Intrepid and Alticor and virus is, if you have those tools on top of mating disruption, you are going to have no issues with, with Colleen moth. Um, I would just recommend using at least one of the models um, that, that's available. Um, DAS obviously is our, our go-to because that's the WSU model. Okay, so the goal uh, uh, for my program really is to start to provide better tools or improve those improved tools 
that are already available uh, to help you achieve this goal of conserving natural enemies, but also suppressing Scylla. Um, so some things we were working on is the uh, use of surround and kind of improving the use of surround using other particle films, are they useful? Um, and then uh, these soft insecticide and precision spray programs. Uh, honeydew washing is something else we've been working with. And, and finally, some more novel strategies uh, are the use of reflective mulch and extende uh, as, a, as repellents. I'm mainly gonna focus on particle films and surround for this talk, um, just to kind of not overwhelm you with anything. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about honeydew washing as well. So let's talk about particle films. This has kind of been the focus of our work for the past couple years. Um, Basically, the, the way that these things work, and surround has kind of historically been the, the, the mainstay for Scylla control, is that there are these powders, these wettable powders that you spray onto the tree, and they create this, well, they create multiple forms of, of control. So that it's a visual or a host masking effect. So when Scylla are choosing to colonize an orchard, from external sources, uh, this, this makes the orchard just look kind of funny. It turns it a different color and it's quite a bit whiter. It's reflecting UV light. So the Scylla are less likely to invade. For those that are already there or that do invade anyway, um, it creates this tactile repellent. So it's just not a pleasant surface for the insects to land on. It's hard for them to grip and to lay eggs. And then in general, if they are in there and, and, and trying to survive on a plant or a pear tree covered in surround, um, it's an irritant. So it gets all over their body. And as, as you can see in this picture um, or in this video, it, it just it gums everything up and it makes it difficult for them to grip and they end up spending a lot more time uh, uh, grooming and, and, and just uh, being irritated than feeding. So it has this insecticidal effect. Um, the pictures on the right are just the uh, electron scanning microscope pictures of uh, the Scylla's foot, essentially. And on the top, you have a regular Scylla foot with its little hairs that help it grip. And then on the bottom, it's all gummed up with surround. Um, so it's not doing, it can't do its job as well. So when we first got started, uh, when I first got here, one of the first experiments I did was this greenhouse experiment um, looking at different repellents and how they work against Paracilla. And the main finding we had here is that man, surround really had a heck of an effect um, as, as far as repelling Scylla from laying eggs on these plants. And we were also doing some insecticide bioassays as well. And even our best insecticides, uh, we weren't uh, you know, always getting in incredible results. Uh, in this one, we, we got pretty good mortality, but, you know, our question was, you know, if, if the insecticides are harming the natural enemies and surround seems to work so well at repelling over position, how does it, how good is it if you just use it by itself? So we, we, took this to the field and set up a, a larger scale field trial uh, where we looked at um, a standard insecticide program with surround, but also um, insecticides uh, uh, integrated into the program as is what is normally done in a conventional program. And then we did another program where we just looked at two sprays of surround pre-bloom and our results uh, show that the surround alone, if you have good coverage and you spray twice before bloom, we ended up with just as good a control on uh, Paracilla as the, the conventional insecticide program. And this wasn't because this was an orchard where it was low pressure, as you can see from our control, our untreated check. I mean, we had an enormous Scylla population and you know, this wasn't, these weren't massive plots either. So uh, there was certainly a lot of Scylla pressure on those surround plots and, and they held their own. And we did this two years in a row and saw very similar results the second year. Um, actually made the surround plots uh, even maybe look a little bit better in, in the second year. Uh, but as you can see in the first, uh, in the check in this year, we actually put one surround spray on just to see how that would affect things. And it, and it did help the check plots a little bit, but still you really need to get two surround sprays for it to be fully effective. 
So some of you may be thinking that, um, you know, it's really hard to get surround on your plots, especially that first spray early in the spring, especially if you have these really steep plots that hold snow and moisture. Um, is, is there an option for, for these kind of plots? And, and one thing that we've looked into that people have looked into in the past as well, um, but we wanted to get some uh, hard data on it is uh, using surround in the fall. Um, and, and having it actually carry over into the spring and control Paracillo that following spring. So surround is a really sticky material uh, and that's that's part, part of the reason why we thought it might work. Um, so we've uh, performed this experiment. Uh, we're going on our third year now of doing this. Um, we skipped a year in 2019, but we're doing it again this year. Uh, we're, we're using commercial sites to do different surround sprays. So in, in, in these years, we did two surround sprays, one before leaf drop in September, one after leaf drop in October, late October, and then a standard spray in March, and then an untreated plot. And we did this over six orchards in, in 2018. Um, and what we found was that uh, when we when we do these uh, analyses and, and image J cutting cutting the the stems off and um, seeing how well the residues last is that the surround residues definitely fade to the naked eye. However, when we analyze them, you can still see that they are uh, quite a bit wider than uh, the untreated checks. So there, the the surround really does hang around, though maybe not 100. It, it sticks around. Um, uh, more importantly, what effect does it have on the scylla? Well, even though we can't see the surround, it definitely seems to have an effect on, on the scylla uh, the following spring. So we can see the, uh, especially the after leaf drop in terms of scylla eggs there, uh, the spray that occurred in October basically did almost as well as the spray in March, statistically just as well as the spray in March uh, for controlling pear scylla. Uh, so this method can definitely be effective, especially if you know you're not going to be able to get into your block in the early spring. Uh, we're definitely recommending uh, using the surround as a fall spray. Uh, the main thing to consider is just trying to get into your block as, as late as possible, uh, but don't wait too long because if you wait too long, you probably won't get in. So we've also been asked to look at quite a few different particle films that people are, are substituting for surround. Um, so sea light is diatomaceous earth and then uh, microna is a calcium carbonate nutrient. Uh, before we discuss this too much further, I do just wanna add the disclaimer that microna is, um, is a nutrient uh, and it doesn't have a label for insecticidal use. So uh, it is illegal to use Microna for uh, insecticidal use as the primary goal. If you're using it to add calcium, um, that's fine. And if you get some, you know, if it does something to the Scylla, then that's, that's okay. But as long as it's not your main goal. Um, so people are using uh, Microna though, and they're using the sea light as well. So we wanted to look at what kind of effects they are having on Paracilla. So we started just with some lab, uh, lab trials to, to see how well uh, these uh, methods compare to surround in terms of uh, repelling Paracilla and then also uh, reducing survivorship of the, the juveniles. And on the left graph, you can see the overpositional uh, deterrence or the uh, repellency uh, from the different materials and surround and sea light really seem to be um, the more effective products. Uh, statistically, it's a little bit variable there. There's some intermediates. However, it, it definitely appears that the surround and sea light are, are top materials. Microna, if you really look at it, it doesn't go on nearly as white as, as surround or sea light. So this is kind of what we'd expect it to kind of be an, an intermediate effect. Uh, as far as um, reducing survivorship of juveniles on the right graph, uh, really all the, all the particle films um, work pretty effectively, uh, and, and as does oil. Um, in the lab, it seems like oil does a decent job of reducing survivorship, uh, just like it has other mortal effects on, um, on Scylla. So we have also looked at these materials in the field, and we really have a lot of data on different aspects of this, but I, I'm just gonna kind of keep things simple. Uh, and, and kind of, I feel like the, these two graphs 
do a good job of showing what we're seeing overall. And, and really, it's, again, the surround and sea light seem to be the more effective products uh, when we're using them in the field, kind of in that early summer time frame uh, as far for controlling Scylla. My Chrono definitely seems to have an effect. Uh, however, it's it's intermediate. And so if again, if you're using this as a as a nutrient, um, you know, you may get a little bit of benefit on pear Scylla. However, uh, A, it's not legal to use it as your only control method for Scylla and, and B, it doesn't seem to be quite as effective as the other two materials. A little bit about honeydew washing. So honeydew washing is basically the, again, the strategy of uh, just trying to rinse away that, that injurious honeydew that Scylla produce because the Scylla really aren't the biggest part of the problem. It's the honeydew that they're excreting. That's the issue. So, um, a lot of people, when they're attempting IPM strategies or, or uh, an, IT, an IPM program, uh, one of the issues is that the psyllis start to kind of pick up a little bit. And because you have, you're not an organic program, you have the option of using conventional materials. People tend to get worried and pull in the trigger and basically ditching the IPM program. And then they kill off their natural enemies and they end up in a whole world of issues later in the season. Um, however, it is tough because if you're relying on natural enemies, you're kind of taking a risk and hoping that they're going to show up and do what you're being told they will do. And, uh, you know, I, I understand that's a little scary. Um, the great thing about honeydew washing is it acts as an insurance policy. So if things get a little bit scary, you know, you know that you have this in your back pocket and you'll be able to basically wash the issue away if you end up with a little more honeydew than you feel um, is, is okay. Um, and you don't have to use the insecticide right away. You can kind of buy yourself a little bit more time to hold out and see if those natural enemies really are going to show up. Oh no, it's not working. Okay, there it goes. Thank you. So for uh, overhead washes, this is the, the system that we're promoting just because it's so easy. And um, uh, again, we're not suggesting that you use overheads for irrigation. We're, we're hoping that people will, and, and a lot of people have installed these separate systems that are simply there to wash honeydew away because we know that under tree, irrigation is, is quite a bit more effective and it's much safer in terms of um, not promoting pathogens and not causing fire blight outbreaks and things like that. So having this separate system that's an overhead system that you only use when you have uh, too high uh, Scylla honeydew um, levels, um, th this is what we're suggesting. And with a system like this, you can easily turn it on. You really only need around three to six hours of washing, um, if you have a, a, a good amount of volume, like seven, so we're we're getting in our system uh, uh, 72 gallons uh, per acre per minute. Um, so it's a lot of water um, going through there, but it's again, it's very very easy this way. So uh, it, it's just a, a simple method to, to take care of your honeydew issues, and you can do this once or twice a year, and and that's really enough to just take care of a, a honeydew issue if it happens, especially in kind of that late summer, midsummer timeframe in July. Um, and then that kind of gets you through to when you, your natural enemies show up. So here's an example of what something, what an IPM program using um, uh, incorporating honeydew washing might look like. So often, especially in a, the first year or two of an IPM program, you see something that looks like this, where your psyllin nymphs are a little bit higher uh, than they would be in your standard conventional program. Um, and this is uh, from our block. These are data from our block where you're seeing exactly that. Um, and you're thinking to yourself, well, man, this is, uh, I'm probably going to have more injury in my, in my IPM block. Uh, however, for us, we use two, just two tree washes in our IPM block as well. And that was enough to, to, basically give us the exact same amount of injury that we had in our 
uh, conventional block that had much lower numbers of Scylla. So having a little more Scylla isn't a big deal. And in fact, it can be kind of beneficial uh, because those Scylla draw in natural enemies. And then that's a good way to, to, to really inoculate your block with uh, natural control measures. All right, so let's just kind of go over um, uh, uh, just some general strategies and we'll, and we'll wrap it up there. Um, so early season management, dormant through petal fall, uh, really relying on, on the kale and clay, the surround. Um, it, it's just such an effective tool. And when you use it, especially if you get two sprays on, one starting very early, you really don't need to do these big tank mixes of uh, broad spectrum insecticides. And in fact, we'd really encourage you to, to back off of those tank mixes because again, you wanna promote your natural enemies. Um, definitely try to get in as early as you can. If you can't get in early, consider using a, a fall spray of surround. Uh, we, we've seen that this really helps um, just keep the Scylla out of your block in the first place. Um, and then come in again uh, with another surround just before bloom, um, because you're not going to be able to spray an insecticide during bloom. So you want something that's going to carry you over through that time period where Scylla seemed to lay a lot of eggs. Um, remember, I was talking about that bud burst time frame. Um, it, it's pretty much guaranteed that you're going to have to, especially in Wenatchee, we just have such high pressure here. You're going to have to get a knockdown on, on Scylla adults at some point in the early season. So depending on how high your pressure is, uh, will, that will dictate what, what kind of insecticide you need to use if you have to go full throttle with a Malathion or a Bexar or a Sale or Delegate. All those are very effective products. If you're going to go with that, uh, right before bud burst is the time because that is when the bud starts to open up and it's going to continue to grow and develop. So even a surround right there, it's not going to do you as much good as just getting a good knockdown on your adults because the bud is just going to keep growing and producing new tissue that you would have to continue to cover with surround. So right before that happens, if you can knock down the adult population that's there, uh, that's, that's a, a good time to do it. So just remember, just before that bud opens up. And if your pressure is not as high or if you're organic, um, using a oil, a uh, higher rate of oil, uh, Cinerate, and the neem products like Aza Direct or Nemix. Um, and you can uh, mix the Cinerate and the, the, the Nemix um, or Aza Direct together. Uh, generally, if you do that before the bud opens up, you're, you're less likely to see any sort of uh, um, phytotoxicity issues. Um, just be careful if you have Camise. Camise tends to be really sensitive and, and you can't use the neem products. So as far as getting later into the season, uh, past, past bloom, we've seen that you can continue with the particle films, uh, maybe just one or two more sprays, at, one at Petal Fall, uh, another maybe in May uh, or even early June. Um, either the surround or, or the sea light seem to be the most effective products at those time points. And if you do them before June or even into early June, uh, we really don't see that you have issues with putting too much um, uh, residues on the fruit. Um, so, it, or at least they'll, they're, they're much more likely to wash off when they first get into the warehouse. Uh, just be careful not to use too much, and especially if you have certain pair varieties, like the red pair varieties, uh, they're, they're gonna be a little more strict at the warehouse there, and you might not wanna use them past May. Um, so using the selective materials will help preserve these natural enemies. Um, you can use these more often. They're just, they're not as uh, gonna have, they're not gonna have as much of an effect on natural enemies because they don't last as long. So it's just a quick shot and then they kind of go away and they're just not as potent to begin with. So you can do shorter interval sprays uh, with these more selective materials like the IGRs or the, the neem and Cinerate products, those kinds of things. Um, and then again, remember going soft on codling moth is going to allow those natural enemies to, 
to develop and do their thing against Paracilla, which is what we we absolutely have to do. Um, and keep tree washing as a as a insurance policy in your back pocket. Um, if you want to go for installing the system, it's really uh, it's not that expensive, and it's a good and it's a good investment. It's not expensive long term. Um, but if you don't have a system, you can always use uh, a, a wash uh, through your uh, air blast sprayers, just using a high volume, such as 800 gallons per acre. So the main takeaway message here is that we want to suppress our paracilla early um, while conserving our natural enemies. So every every time you go out there and you're you're thinking about management, um, just think what what am I doing that's gonna uh, it's going to, um, how is it going to affect my, my natural enemies? Am I going to knock these guys back? Because you know, you're going to need them later in the season. Uh, what we really don't want to see is this situation here on the right, where we have a completely defoliated orchard because we let our Scylla take off late in the season. Cause not only is this bad for our trees, bad for our fruit, but it's also keeping the populations of Paracilla really high. So with that, I just want to thank you guys for uh, listening to the talk today. I uh, thank the, my different funding sources uh, it's prom that are promoting this research, the, um, uh, the Fresh and Processed Pair Committees. Um, uh, we have a, a USDA NIFA grant and then a, a, a WSDA grant as well, and then our various industry donations that, that we've gotten. Uh, please go to our website and, and check us out and follow the stuff we're doing. And then uh, you can also follow our work through Fruit Letter or Fruit Matters newsletter. Um, and at this point, I will stop talking and take any questions if you guys have them.